Roll. We have uh, 10 people in already, I can see. Let's just let the numbers climb a little bit. Well, Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, and welcome to uh, the last of our seminars for this season, season one. Um, gives me great, great pleasure to, to have Lucy McGregor present to us today. Uh, but before I introduce Lucy, I'd just like to talk about, um, oh, there we are. So which, this is the last one, and we've had I didn't even count, 35, I think, MNRs through, through this season. And it's been a tremendous uh, success. When we started this, we were unsure how popular it would be, but it's been immensely popular. And we were initially planning maybe one a month, maybe two a month, but uh, the, the interest has been so great, we've put one on a week. And you can view all of these on the MTNet MNR page or on the YouTube channel and almost all presenters have made their PowerPoints available to you. And this is a, a lasting legacy. So we are going to kick off season. We're going to have a, a summer break now for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere, a summer break. <laughs> um, we are going to have a bit of a break now for a couple of months and come back in late September. And we have already quite a few lined up presentations for the, we'll go till about the end of June. So nine months or so. We've got quite a, a few lined up already, but we're still looking for volunteers who wish to present the work. Um, so I, today we have Lucy McGregor and uh, Lucy and I were just chatting and realizing we met each other in Brest at the NEM induction workshop, 1994, which is, well, almost 30 years ago. Um, and Lucy's gonna, is, um, I'm very pleased that she's this year's uh, SCG quarter one, quarter two distinguished lecturer. And she'll talk to us this morning on multi-physics analysis, extracting the most from diverse data sets. Uh, Lucy sent her CV around and you, you will have seen it when you registered. Um, PhD in Cambridge, went on to Scripps. As a green scholar, I was actually a green scholar as well in 19... 88, so quite a bit before you. Uh, and then uh, in came back to Cambridge uh, and then joined the uh, NOC in Southampton, working on CSEM and then formed, uh, went to the dark side, so to speak, formed OM uh, and joined the company as a CTO and stayed with the company through its merger with rock solid images and left in uh, 2018 and formed a, a new company co-founded Edinburgh Geoscience Advisors. So it gives me great pleasure to hand over now to, to Lucy. Okay, let me uh, share my screen. Share that one. Uh, Excellent. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Alan. Um, uh, I'm going to talk today about multi-physics analysis and, and getting the most out of multi-physics or very diverse data sets. Um, as Alan said, this came about as part of the SEG Distinguished Lecture Series. I gave a couple of those lectures. I've actually modified what I'm going to talk about today um, from the more general talk I gave to a general SEG audience. Um, I'm going to, to make it a bit more specific for the uh, the, the more specialized MNR audience we have today. And I'm gonna concentrate on talking about um, applications of multi-physics um, in exploration and prospect appraisal. And then I'll give you some thoughts at the end about how this might be more widely applicable. Um, some acknowledgements to start with. Um, I need to thank the SEG and the SEG Foundation because obviously this did come about as part of an, an SEG lecture series. 
Um, our little company, Edinburgh Geoscience Advisors, works with a number of places or a number of entities around the world, including Ocean Floor Geophysics in Vancouver. Um, and I also need to say, say a big thank you to my former colleagues at Rock Solid Images, which is now part of PGS. Um, a lot of what I'm going to show you today was done when I was still at Rock Solid Images. Um, on the right hand side of this screen is a list of uh, many colleagues and former colleagues and collaborators over the years who I've worked with. Um, looking at multi-physics analysis, putting EM data together with, with other data types. Um, and it's quite a long list, in fact, and it's not exhaustive, it should be even longer. Uh, but the reason for having it there is, is to make a very important point, which is to do multi-physics analysis, you need to have a multi-physics team of people around you. So on this list are other EM specialists, but also seismologists and petrophysicists and rock physicists and geologists, all of whom come together to produce um, robust interpretations of subsurface rock and fluid properties by bringing their expertise together. So this is what I'm going to talk about. I'll start with a, a quick introduction about why we might consider multi-physics analysis or putting data sets together and the challenges around that. Um, and then I'll talk briefly about what we mean by multi-physics analysis. And, and I mean, to answer that question now, uh, when someone says multi-physics analysis, um, it, it, it could mean almost anything. There are many different approaches that fall under that banner. Um, I'm going to spend more, most of the time giving you a couple of examples, um, um, looking at integrated interpretation and petrophysical joint inversion for understanding the subsurface in the context of, of prospect appraisal. Um, I'll finish with some thoughts on, on future applications and other areas where the, the approaches that I'm going to take you through today might be applicable, um, and then some conclusions. So let's start with an introduction about why we consider multi-physics data. Um, and really, we need to start at a very high level. Why do we consider geophysics at all? Um, well, we do geophysics because we want to know something about the Earth. Um, we want to know something about geology or properties. So that might be lithology or mineralogy. It might be porosity um, or what the pore fluid is or the saturation of that fluid. It might also be ge a geomechanical property, perhaps stress or pore pressure. Um, so there's a range of things that we want to know about the earth. Um, and then at the other end, there's a range of things that we can actually measure. So we don't measure these properties we're interested in directly. We go out and measure geophysical attributes such as impedance or reflectivity, uh, we can look at attenuation, and that could be attenuation of a seismic signal or attenuation of an electromagnetic signal. Um, and then from these measurements, we can derive huge numbers of other attributes. Seismologists in particular are really good at measuring seismic data and then creating hundreds of other combinations of the data that they've got. So Poisson's ratio, we can look at curvature, lambda rho, nu rho. There's a million different attributes that we can look at. Uh, the problem we have is that in terms of the physical properties we're actually measuring, there aren't that many. We can measure velocities, uh, we can measure resistivity, we can measure density, um, but the, 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 there aren't that many properties given the number of things we want to know, and as geophysicists, the number of attributes we create to try and determine them. Um, we've got a bottleneck in the middle. Gary Mavco called this the rock physics bottleneck of, of geophysical surveying. Um, now, one of those properties is resistivity. It sits alongside all the other properties that we can measure. And so if we want to try and, and make a characterization of all of these kind of geological properties, it behooves us to use as many of these physical parameters as we can. So putting resistivity into that equation along with velocity, density, and all the other things we can measure is very important. Um, now, one of the clearest ways to see that is in well log analysis. Well log analysis is inherently a multi-physics process. So when a well is drilled into the earth, um, we log it with a series of tools uh, so we can measure the velocity. So this track here is, is the, the acoustic velocity. We've got the shear velocity here. Um, this is a measurement of density. Uh, this is a gamma ray measurement, which tells us about shale layers. Uh, here's resistivity, um, neutron porosity. Um, and then what we do is we give all that information to a clever petrophysicist and they perform an analysis and they tell us what we actually want to know, which is the lithology. So this is the lithology track from that well. Uh, Gray stuff is shale. Um, so this is a shale cap rock. The, the yellow stuff is sand. So we can see we've got a nice shale cap rock sitting over a sand reservoir. 
And then most importantly, we can see that that sand is charged with, with oil in this case. So the green stuff here on this fluid track is telling us the saturation of oil. So to make this interpretation, we use all of this diverse data, including resistivities, velocities, densities, and everything else. Now, the same should be true of geophysics. When we make a geophysical measurement of the subsurface, uh, the most common one is, is to make a seismic measurement, at least in the exploration context or in, in oil and gas exploration. Uh, we make a seismic measurement. From that, we can derive acoustic elastic impedance, um, and we use that to interpret the Earth. Well, we'll get a better result if we also include complementary information. And the complementary information I'm going to talk about today is resistivity information from controlled source electromagnetic sounding. Uh, taking all of that data together in a multi-physics analysis allows us to produce a much better interpretation of lithology and fluid properties, the things we actually want to know, than if we only have one measurement. So it's not entirely simple putting these data sets together. There are a number of challenges we need to overcome um, if we want to integrate these data sets. Um, we need to find a way to couple together very different physical properties. So here's James Clark Maxwell and Hermann von Helmholtz, and they're not looking at each other. Um, they, 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 there isn't an overlap between the seismic realm and the electrical realm, and we need to find a way to couple those together. Um, this is done in several ways. Um, we can look at structural couplings through cross-gradient type approaches, and they work very effectively. Uh, we can look at rock physics coupling methods, uh, where we build either deterministic or statistical relationships between electric and elastic properties. But somehow we need to couple those two domains together if we want to combine the data sets. Uh, the second point, or the second challenge, is perhaps very obvious, but, but worth stating. Um, if you want to combine two data sets, they both need to be sensitive to the same bit of the Earth. Um, if they're not, then you're onto a loser before you even start. So we need good sensitivity to the area we're interested in, in, the, in both data sets that we're trying to combine or in whatever data sets we're trying to combine. Uh, the third, third challenge is one of scale. Um, and, and of all of them, this is probably the one that bites us the hardest. Um, seismic and CSEM and well log data, we'll talk a bit about well log data, they sample the earth at very different scales and we need to reconcile those scales if we're going to put these data sets together in an integrated interpretation or a joint inversion type approach. So what do we mean by multi-physics integration? Well, we, we can mean a whole range of things. Um, the first distinction is that there are broadly speaking two classes of problem that are addressed with multi-physics approaches. Um, the first is multi-physics for structure, where there is something about the structure of the Earth that we want to understand um, that we can't determine using a single data type. So uh, good examples of that are imaging around areas of, of salt or in areas of basalt coverage. Um, and multi-physics approaches combining seismic and CSEM and MT data and gravity and magnetics in some cases um, have been extremely effective at improving images in areas of complex structure. Now that is a seminar all on its own. And in fact, you've heard that seminar already um, from uh, several people during the MNR series. So I'm not gonna talk about that further. What I want to concentrate on today is the second class of multi-physics uh, problems where what we want to know is a property of the earth in a specific area. So we want to understand the, the, the porosity or the clay content or the saturation and fluid type within a reservoir in the subsurface. Um, so I'm going to concentrate on that today. Um, now, in terms of the approaches to multi-physics analysis, um, there are many different approaches ranging from purely qualitative approaches, for example, simple co-rendering, read a resistivity volume into your favorite visualization package, and then read a seismic volume into that package as well, and then look at them together. And, and that's very powerful in many situations. But it can also be a bit misleading that the, the human eye has a tendency to see patterns where there may not actually be patterns or there's no causal link between the two things you're looking at. So this is a great starting point, but we probably want to be a little more, a little more quantitative. Um, structurally constrained inversion is a, an important part of the process. Um, and then we move on to, to processes such as quantitative integrated interpretation. And what I mean there is putting data sets together without formally inverting them. Um, so putting them together um, using um, multi-physics attribute analysis approaches, for example, and I'm going to show you an example of that in a minute. 
Uh, then we move on to the inversion approaches, petrophysical joint inversion, where we invert geophysical attributes jointly. So we invert um, impedances and resistivity directly for rock and fluid properties. And then finally, full joint inversion, where we actually invert the data directly for rock and fluid properties. Um, now, joint inversion works really, really well for structural problems. It's really, really difficult for property problems. And although um, I and, and others have, have tried it, I, I don't think we yet have a, a good general solution for the joint inversion problem. So today I'm going to show you two examples, one of quantitative integrated interpretation and one of petrophysical joint inversion. A final point to make is that these, pro these, these approaches are not all universally applicable. So generally speaking, the, the more quantitative approach, uh, the more stringent the requirements from the data in order for it to be successful. So uh, qualitative approaches like co-rendering, we can always do that, uh, whatever the data set. By the time we get to joint inversion, we require good quality data sets with good sensitivity to the, the properties that we're interested in. So generally speaking, how we've operated workflows is to start at the qualitative end of this arrow and then move as far to the right, as far to the quantitative side as we need to, to answer a geophysical question um, and as, as is possible given the data sets that we have at our disposal. So with that as an introduction, um, I'll go on and, and give you a couple of examples of this. Um, so my first example is a quantitative integrated interpretation example where we're going to take two separate data sets a seismic data set and a, a well log and an EM data set. We're going to use well logs as a calibration to allow us to, to knit together the, the elastic and the electric domains. Um, and then we're going to put those data sets together to understand, in this case, a saturation problem in the subsurface. So here's an overview of the work workflow. Uh, it's really a two step process. So we start with geophysical data. Uh, in this case, we've got pre stacked seismic data. Um, and control source electromagnetic data. And in the first step, we take that, those two data sets and we interpret them separately. So we invert the seismic data, data and that gives us acoustic and elastic impedance. And then we invert the electromagnetic data and that gives us an anisotropic resistivity. So that's step one. And then in step two, uh, we put those two data sets together uh, to understand the underlying rock and fluid properties. And key to that is, is well log calibration, is an understanding of the link between the electric and the elastic. So here's the problem. Um, the area that we're working in here is in the Northern Barents Sea. Uh, so uh, Norway is at the south of this map here, and we're up in a, a license area called PL723 uh, in the Northern Barents Sea. Uh, this is some work that we did at Rock Solid Images with um, Angie, uh, who were exploring in that area. Um, now, exploration in this area uh, has had a mixed history, a mixed success rate. Uh, the Wisting discovery was uh, made in 2013, and that was a large oil discovery, and everyone got very excited about that. And then they got even more excited uh, when the Hansen oil well was drilled uh, a year later, and that also discovered oil. Uh, there was then a small gas discovery at Mercury uh, later in 2014, um, which, which was equally exciting. Um, so everyone got very excited. And then things went a bit wrong. A number of wells were drilled on positive seismic indications of hydrocarbon, uh, which turned out to be subcommercial, to contain only residual hydrocarbons in the, the targeted prospects. Um, so Apollo, Atlantis, and Bialand all fall into that category. Um, and this drove the operators in the area to think, well, what else can we do to try and de-risk the, the exploration in this area? And that's where CSAM comes in. That's where the electrical measurement as a complement to the seismic um, really adds a lot of information, uh, allowing better decisions to be made. Um, so the area in question um, is called Maya. It's up here, just to the north of the Wisting discovery. Um, and I've got a map in the center. So the, the colors are the top reservoir depth from seismic. Um, and you can see the prospect we're interested in is outlined in dark blue here. Um, so we've got uh, 3D seismic data to play with. Um, we've got a nodal CSEM data set. This was acquired by EMGS. Um, so this is nodal CSEM. The little black squares are the CSEM receivers and the source was towed over all of those receiver lines. So we have quite a rich 3D EM data set. 
Um, and then we have a single well for calibration, uh, which is the Apollo well here, uh, and that, that contained only residual hydrocarbon, but it's our, it's our cal calibration point. Um, the key decision that was to be made was a drill or drop decision. So Angie were trying to decide whether to uh, go to the expense of drilling in this block or whether relinquishing it, relinquishing the license completely and walking away. So it's quite a significant decision to be made. Um, here is the reason why drilling results have been mixed in this area. Um, so the, the Apollo log is shown on the, the left hand side here. So we've got a lithology track and this is the reservoir inter interval we're interested in. It's a shore face deposit from the Jurassic um, known as the Stir interval, which is seen all over the Barents Sea. It's a fairly high porosity sand interval. Um, in Apollo, it contained only, um, only residual hydrocarbons. So you can see just on this on the saturation log, just a tiny bit of gas in that, in that um, uh, reservoir interval. Um, we've also got plots of acoustic impedance and Poisson's ratio, which is a, a, a measure of, of how much a, a piece of material bulges outwards when you squish it. Um, so um, here's a, 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 an elastic cross plot space. We're looking at basically the cross plot of these two curves, P impedance versus Poisson's ratio. And in the background in gray is the data from the well itself. And the colors show a rock physics fluid substitution where we've changed the fluid in that reservoir uh, from water wet in blue through oil saturated in green to gas saturated either with a commercial saturation of 80% or what was actually found 20% or less gas, fizz gas it's called. And you can see that in this elastic space uh, the, the commercial and the sub-commercial hydrocarbon charges are exactly the same. There's no difference in response. And that tells us that we can't use seismic to distinguish those two possibilities, commercial versus sub-commercial. Um, on the right-hand side is a, a multi-physics cross-plot space. So we've got impedance versus resistivity. And you can see immediately that the, the resistivity, the electrical measurement is going to tell us what we need to know. We can't distinguish oil from gas. It's just resistive stuff but we can see commercial hydrocarbon as compared to either water wet or fizz gas sediments. So adding that electrical, electrical component makes a big difference to the interpretation. So let's step through this. Let's look at the seismic data first. Um, here's an example of the seismic data from the area. Uh, so the map on the, uh, on the right hand side has Maya still outlined in, in blue. Um, and we're looking at an arbitrary line between A and A prime in this case, along the, the green dashed line uh, along here. So the top reservoir interval is labeled top rail grinning here. And you can see we're looking at a series of faulted blocks that may or may not be hydrocarbon charged. That's what we want to know. Um, now, the interesting thing when you look at this seismic section, you can see the reservoir very clearly, uh, but you also start to see these little bright areas in the overburden. And if we zoom in on this area here, um, you can see all these little bright spots that are, are coincident with faults. And one of the things that might be causing that is, is very low saturations of gas along the faults. So indicative of leaking faults that perhaps we don't have a, a, a seal that's complete across these, across these fault blocks. Now we can isolate those bright spots using seismic attribute analysis. So if we cross plot the seismic variance, which is a post stack attribute that measures trace to trace variability. Um, so we cross plot that with trace envelope, which measures the energy of the trace. And we look at high variance, high envelope, then what essentially we're doing is looking for very bright areas that are very laterally constrained. So we're looking for these bright spots along faults. And if we take those areas, that, that area of the cross plot and project it back onto the map, uh, you can see all the little red areas here are areas that contain those bright spots along the fault. And so might be indicative of leaking hydrocarbon of, a, of a, a, an incomplete seal. Um, so that's quite interesting around Apollo where we know that there is only residual hydrocarbons. So there's a pretty high chance the seal is blown there. Uh, you can see quite a lot of this leakage in the, the, the faults in the overburden. Um, to the south, there's quite a lot of leakage as well. Up over our prospect, however, it maybe looks a bit better. So at this stage, perhaps we're, we're still some chance that we might be looking at a good prospect. So we can carry on with the interpretation. Um, 
our starting point in the seismic analysis is um, the inversion or, or the results of inversion of the pre-stack seismic data. So we used a simultaneous pre-stack impedance inversion to invert angle stacks for uh, acoustic and elastic impedance. And I'm showing you here the, the P wave impedance on this, on this plot across the reservoir interval um, and the Poisson's ratio, uh, the, the prospect is now outlined in white, as you can see. Um, so we've got impedance now. Uh, the next question is, what can we do with that? Um, well, one of the things we can do is we can use a, a calibration approach based on the well logs, where what we do is we use the well logs to calibrate a function that relates the elastic attributes to the porosity, um, which is one of the properties we're interested in, and then apply that to the seismic data, and that allows us to make a map of porosity, which you're, you're looking at here. Um, so again, this is across the reservoir interval. Uh, here's our prospect. Uh, you can see high porosity at the Apollo well, which is good, about 20-21%. Uh, the porosity is slightly lower in our prospect, but it's still pretty good. It's still a, a, a nice prospect. Um, you can see uh, to, if we move to the north, as, as the reservoir interval gets deeper, the porosity decreases. That's simply a compaction effect. Um, now, we want to know if that's right, so we can compare those results. Uh, to well log data from the region. So here's a porosity depth map or a porosity depth graph based on regional wells. So we've taken all the wells that we can we have access to in the surrounding area and calculated the porosity in the reservoir interval and then plotted that on a map. And you can see there's a, there's a very clear um, porosity depth trend as you would expect. Now, interestingly, if you look at the closest three wells to this area, so that's Apollo, um, Wisting, which we've talked about, that's just to the south, and a well called Alpha, which is in the area. Um, the trend is actually close to the regional trend, but, but slightly lower, slightly lower porosity. And in fact, if you then plot the seismically derived data over that, that trend, uh, you can see that the seismically derived porosity follows pretty nicely along that trend that we see in the data from the wells. So we've got quite a lot of confidence that our, our porosity is a, a robust estimation of, of what we're seeing in the subsurface. So that's great. We understand, if you like, the container that, that may or may not contain hydrocarbon. Um, what else can we do? Um, well, we also want to understand how well the seismic actually can characterize not only the lithology, but the fluid. Um, so the next thing we did is we used a statistical, uh, a statistical fascist classification. Uh, based on rock physics. And that's a three-step process. So we start with the wells as calibration. Um, and from the wells, based on cutoffs, we defined three, uh, sorry, five different lithofluid fascias, shale, wet sand, oil sand, fizz gas sand, and gas sand. The thing we're interested in is the, 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 uh, the red stuff, and we want to, or, or green, and we want to distinguish that from the other fascias. Um, so we cross plot, plot that in impedance Poisson's ratio space again. Um, here's our trend of increasing fluid um, compressibility. Uh, the next thing we did, because we know from the seismic that the porosity in the prospect is a bit lower than we're seeing at the wells, is we used uh, the rock physics relationships to augment the data from the wells um, by decreasing the porosity along that compaction trend. So we've now got a, a richer data set that covers the range of porosities we're likely to see in the prospect. Uh, based on that, uh, we can use a kernel density estimation to calculate a series of two-dimensional probability density functions um, for each of those fascias that we're interested in. And then we use a Bayesian fascist classification uh, to classify the data um, into each of the five classes. So um, along the bottom here, uh, we've got uh, the probability of each of these different facies that we're interested in, um, again, plotted in impedance Poisson's ratio space. Uh, so we do that for the seismic data, we classify the seismic data, and then we can project that back into the map. Um, and that's what I'm showing you here. So this is the most likely facies that we see when we're seeing one of the hydrocarbon facies. So I've, I'm not bothering with the, the water wet or the shale here, just looking at where the seismic classification suggests that there might be hydrocarbon. Um, and so here's the well. Uh, this is Apollo. And you can see it classifies primarily as, as a gas or a fizz gas sand, which it should do. That's our calibration point. It ought to work at the calibration point. Our prospect is here. Um, and you can see that there is a, a, a probability that we're, we, we have hydrocarbon in that prospect. 
uh, but you can immediately see the problem. We can't tell the difference between an oil sand and a fizz gas sand. It could be either of those two things. Uh, so we know that there might be hydrocarbon there. We just don't know what the saturation is. The seismic can't give us that answer. And that's kind of an important answer if you're making a decision about whether to drill a well. So let's come back to the integrated analysis and look at the EM data next. Uh, so as I say, it was a three-dimensional uh, nodal EM survey. Uh, the first thing we did was invert that data. So on the left-hand side here, uh, we have the, um, the uh, uh, top reservoir map, just for context, just to, to give you a context of what we're looking at. Again, here's the well log. Um, in the center plot, is the transverse resistance from the CSEM data. So we've inverted the CSEM data for anisotropic resistivity and then vertically integrated that model. Um, in, it's the vertical resistivity model that we've vertically integrated across the reservoir interval to give us a transverse resistance in the reservoir zone. Um, high values are the, the higher resistivity, higher transverse resistance. And then on the right hand side is the porosity um, just as an interesting comparison in terms of what we're seeing. Um, so around Apollo, we have relatively low resistivity, which is what you'd expect for residual saturation. Um, we can see to the north, uh, northwest where the porosity starts to decrease, we get an increase in resistivity associated with that compaction trend. So that's nice to see. Um, and actually particularly nice in some of these kind of high, low porosity downthrown blocks uh, you can see there's actually high resistivity associated with them as well, so it's nice to resolve that. Uh, in the prospect itself, uh, the resistivity is a bit higher than Apollo, uh, but, but still relatively low. So um, we can't rule out the presence of hydrocarbon, uh, but it's, it's starting to not look as, as positive as it did when we, we just had the seismic. Um, so now let's put it together. How do we do that second step? Um, well, there's a couple of things we can do. Um, one of the simplest approaches to comparing seismic and EM is simply to put all of the data into a common domain and then compare the data sets. So uh, on the left hand side here, here's the CSEM derived transverse resistance that we just looked at. Um, and then what I've done is, is to take the seismically derived porosity um, and use a rock physics relationship. So in this case, the Simondi relationship, which relates the bulk resistivity that we measure uh, to uh, hydrocarbon saturation, porosity, resistivity of interstitial fluids, and then it's got a clay term here to account for uh, conduction in, in clay minerals. Um, so if we know the porosity from the seismic and we can estimate the clay distribution from the seismic, which we can do, um, then and, and we can calibrate the Archie parameters at the well, then for any given saturation, we can calculate a seismically derived transverse resistance and simply compare them. Um, so in the center, we've got the seismically derived transverse resistance uh, for 100% water wet, so a completely water saturated reservoir interval. And then on the right hand side is the equivalent plot if we saturate the areas that the seismic suggests might be hydrocarbon charged, and we saturate them with 60% hydrocarbon, 40% water. Um, so if we look at the water wet case first, first of all, um, there's actually quite a good correspondence in many areas between the CSEM derived case and the, the water saturated seismically derived case, um, especially up in these areas where we've got lower porosity from the compaction trend in the northwest and in these downthrown blocks, you can see quite a nice correspondence between the, the, the two cases. So there's definitely porosity effects in the, in the EM data. Um, really what we're interested in is the fluid effect, so in the prospect itself, um, slightly elevated resistivity from the CSEM, uh, but actually if you compare these two, it, it looks more like the water wet case than the hydrocarbon charged case. So even with a very simple analysis like this, you can start to say, well, look, it's actually not looking hugely positive here. Um, however, we did take this one step further and we used a lithofluid facies classification uh, based on a, a multi-physics cross-plot space um, so here again is, is a simple elastic space, impedance Poisson's ratio. And the problem we have in the elastic space is distinguishing residual gas from commercial gas. So that's, that's distinguishing area A from area B. Um, so if we look at a cross plot space that includes both seismic and EM attributes, we can do much better. So on the y-axis here, 
uh, we're considering probability of hydrocarbon sand from the seismic. So this is the output of the Bayesian lithofluid facies classification of the seismic data by itself. On the x-axis is resistivity, or in fact, it was transverse resistance in this case from the CSEM. The thing we're interested in is the significant hydrocarbon accumulation. So the yellow stuff, that's what we want to see. And we can distinguish that from uh, the seismic ambiguity, which is residual gas, but also importantly from the EM ambiguity. So other uh, lithologies or properties in the subsurface that, that such as tight sands, carbonates, coals, you sometimes see in this area, other resistive features that are not fluid effects. So if we look in this cross plot space, we should be able to bust all those things apart and get a much better answer. Um, so that's what we've done here. Um, here is the data, the seismic data, the, the, sorry, the multi-physics data plotted in that cross plot space, color coded by point density. So most of the data sits in the the, the wet sand quadrant, which is what you'd expect. Most of the earth is wet sand or wet stuff in general, in the marine setting at least. Um, what we can do is we can take cutoffs, which we calibrate based on the well log data, and then project that space back onto the map. And that's what you see here. Um, so what we wanted to see was lots of yellow stuff. Sadly, what we do see in the prospect is uh, something that is much more likely to be residual hydrocarbon. So the seismic by itself can't tell us whether we're looking at commercial or residual hydrocarbon. When we bring the EM into that analysis in a multi-physics sense, uh, we can now say with much more confidence that, that this is only going to be residual hydrocarbon similar to what we saw at the Apollo well. Um, now, this is an interesting example. Um, and the reason it's interesting is that uh, on the basis of this analysis taken together with, with the risking processes that company companies use, um, Angie decided to drop the block. So they walked away from this area. Um, and that means we, we don't know what the answer is. So we don't know if we were right because the well was never drilled. Um, however, the reason this is important is because these surveys are really only valuable if you make a decision based on the results. So this is a great example where a company's used this as part of their risking process and they made a positive decision based on the multi-physics analysis, in this case, to walk away. So that's the first example. I'm going to show you very briefly a second example, which is one step to the right on this range of approaches from qualitative to quantitative. It's a petrophysical joint inversion example where we want to try and quantify the saturation within a reservoir. Um, so same workflow, it's still a two-step process. So we still start with data, seismic and EM data, and we invert those data sets separately to give us acoustic elastic impedance and resistivity. But now in step two, rather than just comparing the two data sets or performing a, a multi-physics classification, uh, we're actually going to invert the two data sets directly for a quantitative measure of, in this case, saturation. Again, saturation being the thing that was of most importance. So the study area is the same one we've just looked at, but now we're coming down to the Wisting area. Uh, so we're still in the hoop area of the Barents Sea. Here's Norway down the bottom. Uh, but now we're looking at the Wisting Reservoir. So Wisting was discovered uh, by this well in 2014. Um, and then there were two fur or several further wells drilled. But the two we're going to look at in detail um, are this well here. Uh, the Hansen well and, and the well to the south, the Bjorland well. Um, now, I'm going to present this as if we don't know what the well results are. We do uh, now. The first time we looked at this data set, we didn't know what the results were, but, but we do now have the well log calibration. Um, so I'm going to call these prospect one and prospect two, prospect one to the west, prospect two to the east, and present this as if we're trying to work out what's in these two prospects. Um, so in terms of data sets, we again had a seismic and an EM data set and some well logs for calibration. In this case, we had 2D seismic data set that was acquired simultaneously with a toad streamer EM data set by PGS. Um, and then we've got two wells, uh, Wisting Central and Wisting Alternative, which we're going to use as calibration. And we're going to try and predict the outcome um, of, of prospect one and prospect two. So back to the workflow. And again, I'm simply going to step through this. Uh, let's start with the seismic data. Um, now, this time, I'm going to jump straight to the answer. Uh, we used a similar workflow to the one I've just shown you. So I'll just jump straight to the answer here. 
uh, where we've inverted the seismic data. Uh, we've calibrated it to porosity at the bottom. So uh, here's the reservoir interval. It's the Jurassic shore face stir deposit again. Um, and you can see it here. So we've got a nice high porosity reservoir. Uh, it's a clean sand reservoir. We also cal calculated clay to content in this case. So here's the clean sand reservoir that we're interested in, in that stir interval. And then the top plot uh, is again a Bayesian lithofluid fasciis classification, uh, where what we're interested in primarily is the green stuff here. Um, so uh, we're looking for hydrocarbon charged sands. Um, here's Wisting Central, that's the discovery. Uh, it found a, a high hydrocarbon saturation in that interval. Uh, Wisting Alternative was water wet in the Sturt interval. And then we have our two prospects, one to the west, prospect one, one to the east, prospect two. Um, and we're looking along this line here. So along the line through those two, through those wells, or almost through those wells. Um, so is this the answer? Well, no, it isn't, because we still don't know the saturation. And indeed, if we look at these two prospects, both of them from a seismic perspective look pretty good. They both look like they're hydrocarbon charged. They look like they're nice prospects that we should go out and drill. But we don't know the saturation yet. And that's where the EM comes in. So once again, let's look at the EM data. Now, in this case, um, we're going to look at a single line across the, across the, 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 the prospects of interest acquired using a Toad Streamer EM data set. So what we're looking at here is now a 2D inversion along that line. Uh, the top plot is the vertical resistivity. The bottom plot is the horizontal resistivity. Uh, this was an inversion done using uh, Kerry Key's Murray 2D EM code, which is a just wonderful open source code that allows anybody to, to, to do this sort of inversion. Um, so a couple of things to note here. Uh, the first is the horizontal resistivity is much, much lower than the vertical resistivity uh, by a factor of some well, five to 10 often in this area. Uh, the reason for that large difference or that very high electrical anisotropy that we see in this area is that the sediments we're looking at have been uplifted significantly um, in this area by 800 meters to a kilometer. So they've been buried to significant depth, depth squashed, um, which is, has baked in some anisotropy and then uplifted towards the surface. And that anisotropy remains. So we see very high electrical anisotropy in this area. Um, in terms of the resistivity, this is a, a constrained inversion. So we've used seismic horizons to constrain the structure. Uh, the top horizon is the top reservoir. Um, here's the Wisting Central uh, accumulation. So this is high resistivity uh, associated with the oil in Wisting Central. And then our two prospects, uh, one on this side looks slightly resistive and the one on this side looks a bit less resistive. So now we've got resistivity and we've got a seismic characterization. We want to put those two things together. Um, so that's the interesting bit, uh, the petrophysical joint inversion, where we want to invert for saturation. And we want to do that as far as possible at seismic scale. Um, so how do we do that? Um, well, we could just ignore the problem of scale completely. So we could just pretend everything's fine and we've just made these measurements. We'll just ignore it and we'll joint, jointly invert CSEM derived res resistivity um, and the seismically derived porosity or impedance or Poisson's ratio and, and assume everything is fine. Um, and the problem is that's not fine at all. That's just wrong because you haven't done anything to reconcile the scales of the two measurements. Um, we can do a bit better by mapping through transverse resistance. So we can say, um, take our, our relatively low resolution resistivity uh, measurement. Uh, we can map that into the reservoir interval by assuming that the transverse resistance is equivalent, assuming transverse resistance equivalence. And then now once we've mapped it into seismic scale, we can then jointly invert with um, porosity, clay content impedance or other seismically derived attributes. And that's certainly much better uh, but it takes no account of non-reservoir facies, um, so it's still an approximation. Um, so what we actually did is we jointly inverted the transverse resistance using the seismic facies as a framework. So we jointly inverted the transverse resistance uh, with the seismically derived properties um, in a deterministic workflow to find a saturation within that seismic facies framework that best explained the data that, that we had. Um, and that's what I'm showing you here. So at the top is uh, the rock property is the seismic facies classification as before, just for reference. So here are our two prospects, um, 
prospect one, Hansen on one side, Bialand on the other, that look the same from a seismic point of view. At the bottom is the derived saturation. So this is the de saturation derived from jointly inverting the transverse resistance with the seismically derived attributes. Um, Wisting Central has a nice high saturation as we expected it to have. Uh, that's great, that's our calibration point. Hansen to the west also has a fairly high hydrocarbon saturation. And indeed that's what was found when, was drilled, when it was drilled, uh, a, a, a nice oil column in this prospect. Bialand, however, looks like it only contains residual saturation, despite the extremely positive seismic indications. Um, and actually, if you look at seismic data from this area, it's one of the most beautiful amplitude anomalies you've ever seen in seismic in your life. It's, it's a wonderful thing, which is largely why it was drilled. Uh, but the multi-physics analysis shows very clearly that that was, that was only going to come up as residual saturation. And indeed, that's what was found. So again, it's by putting these data sets together that we get a more robust answer uh, that allows a better decision-making process. So, I've taken you through a couple of examples from the oil industry, um, but I wanted to leave you with some thoughts on, on where these approaches might be applicable in the future, um, because they're, they're very widely applicable. I mean, in many ways, multiphysics is useful anywhere you need to know something about the Earth. We should always be thinking about bringing multiple data types together. Uh, but here are just some, some areas that either are now or are likely to become areas where multiphysics approaches are, will be applicable. Um, carbon capture and storage, that's becoming a, a very important application as we, we try and prevent the world getting any hotter than it already is. Um, and clearly, if we want to understand the distribution of saturation in the subsurface um, of, of a supercritical fluid or a gas, seismic does a very good job. Uh, but if we bring other measurements in, um, it can only get more robust. So there's been a lot of modeling of that. This is one example here. Um, from Ayani et al. Um, there are many others where that show that, that this might be an application that in future multi-physics approaches will be extremely valuable for. Um, we can look at groundwater mapping, and I think this has always already been the subject of, of, of an earlier m and um, This is uh, Chloe Gustafsson, Kerry Key, and Rob Evans' excellent result from uh, the, the eastern seaboard of the US, where uh, they used um, electromagnetic techniques, CSEM, MT, to map groundwater, uh, freshwater aquifers in the offshore realm. Um, and again, this is a nice application because it's a, it's a classic example where you want to understand the properties of the fluid. Seismic can give you the container, but it can't tell you about the fluid. That's where EM comes in. So um, as, as more as, as the population increases and we need more water supplies, this it will undoubtedly become a, a, an important application. A seafloor mineral mapping, and again, Karen Weitemeyer spoke about this in a, an earlier m and um, mapping uh, potential mineral deposits on the seafloor uh, for two reasons. Uh, they're a potential uh, resource which might become important as we transition away from oil and gas to renewable sources. But if we're going to do that responsibly, we have to understand these systems. Uh, they're, they're ecologically extremely um, precious and, and um, delicate. So to do that, we need to we need surveying. We need if, uh, as much as possible a non-contact surveying. And that's where collecting rich multi-physics data sets comes in to help us to understand these systems. Um, permafrost mapping, environmental studies. So from this is from Dallas Sherman's paper where they used EM methods to understand permafrost. And you can imagine a setting where you go back and repeat these surveys to understand how it's changing over time, which will help us understand climate change and how that changes. And again, this was an electromagnetic study, but bringing in other data types can only help us to understand that better. Um, another couple, decommissioning. We're moving away from oil and gas, so we're decommissioning um, oil fields. And to do that, we need to understand that that's been done in a robust fashion, which means we need to map the subsurface around these wells. We need to understand that they've been plugged and, and abandoned correctly. Uh, and again, that means we want to understand fluids, fluid distribution. So that's an area that we're now looking at, um, along with my colleagues at OFG, um, uh, whether multi-physics approaches are applicable there. Um, and wind farms. Um, there's a huge explosion in interest in, in wind farms, particularly offshore wind farms. Uh, to implement a wind farm offshore, you need to understand the subsurface. It's a slightly different problem. We're not so much interested in fluid type and saturation. We're interested in geomechanical properties. Uh, but just we're starting to, to show that multi-physics approaches there can also give you a, a more robust solution to that problem. So just some final conclusions before I shut up. Um, 
uh, multi-physics analysis has application in a range of problems. I've shown you some examples from the oil industry, um, but I hope you can see that the, those same approaches have applications across a range of environmental engineering um, renewable type problems. Um, we're fast developing um, from sort of qualitative approaches of putting data sets together to much more quantitative. Um, and as important is a realization that, that to do this, we need multi-physics teams of people. We can't sit in geophysical silos not talking to our seismic colleagues and our rock physics colleagues. Everyone's got to be around the same table and talking the same language to make this work. Um, a key point is that multiple data types doesn't necessarily mean multiple surveys. Um, we often hear, um, particularly in the oil industry, um, oh, it's too expensive to collect that data set. You need to, another data set. Uh, yeah, people shouldn't be thinking about it like that. Often it doesn't mean multiple surveys. It means just thinking very carefully about how you make the most use of a survey crew or a platform that you have in the field so that you can collect these multiple data types together. And really the, the message to leave you with is that, that you'll always get a better answer if you have a range of different geophysical data types that you're trying to put together to understand the earth. Um, so I'm going to leave you with a reference list. Uh, most of what I've shown you is published. So here's the reference list. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you'll be able to pause the video and actually get the reference if you want to follow up with any of these any of these examples in, in more detail. Um, and with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Lucy. That was absolutely brilliant. A, a wonderful sales job for multi-physics. Um, I, I was convinced to do this myself in 1986 when I gave a talk at the Geological Survey of Canada, ended with the resistivity model. And uh, Alan Green told me that Alan, nobody cares about resistivity. <laughs> I think that's, that's um, the, the key point. Nobody cares about resistivity or velocity or no, anything else. Exactly. It's geology that people want to know. <laughs> exactly right. So <clears throat> if uh, people could put questions, please, in the uh, Q&A. Uh, and then what I'd like to do, Lucy, is read out the question so it gets in the, uh, the recording. Uh, and then... You can answer them, hopefully. <laughs> uh, the first that. question is from uh, Syed uh, Mohammed Abtar Farushi. Uh, thank you for your interesting talk. There are many cases that not follow our presumptions about petrophysical models, e.g. E low resistivity pay zones. In such cases, it is not possible to define a valid relationship between seismics then how to distinguish water zone from oil zone in these cases? Yeah, now that's a very interesting question because the two examples I showed you were, um, like, like everybody, you say it's a typical example, but actually they were cases where we do have very good distinct, distinction in the resistivity space. Um, low resistivity pay is, is a very interesting problem for um, for many geophysical methods, but particularly for electromagnetic methods, if there isn't a contrast between a pay and no pay situation, um, then, then obviously you, you kind of fall at the first hurdle. Um, interestingly, a lot of the low resistivity pay that I've seen, it's, it's usually low resistivity because within that pay zone, there are interbedded shale layers or clay layers that, that dramatically reduce the resistivity, even if the, the reservoir is charged. Um, but often they only reduce the resistivity in, in a horizontal sense. So um, in induction log data, for example, you'll see very low resistivity, no contrast with the surrounding uh, sediments. Sometimes in the vertical resistivity, you see a, a higher resistivity. You do actually get a contrast. Um, now then, following on from that is, is your question about how you define a valid petrophysical relationship uh, between acoustic and elastic in that setting. Um, well, the answer is that that's, of course, challenging because now you're in a setting that is highly anisotropic, particularly in the electrical sense. Um, so your relationship needs to take that into account. It needs to take that anisotropy into account um, in terms of, of, um, of building that relationship. Um, with good calibration, it's usually, usually possible to do, uh, to build a, either an empirical relationship between the two, the two domains um, if not a rock physics relationship. Um, however, there are, of course, situations where that petrophysical relationship, um, either you can't build a valid one or simply the data sets are not sensitive enough to the properties that you're interested in. 
And that really brings us back to the challenges that I spoke about at the start. Um, to perform a highly quantitative multiphysics analysis, you need to have good sensitivity in your both your data sets and you need to find some sort of link between the electric and the elastic to put them together. If you simply can't do that, then you'll have to rely purely on the more qualitative approaches to integration. You simply won't be able to go any further. Um, what you would still be able to do potentially is look at some of the structural joint inversion approaches um, that, that might, might help you where you couple the domains together structurally. Not so helpful if you're after reservoir properties, but there might be still be something there that you can do. Um, I, I guess, I mean, it's, a, it's an important point. There is no single approach that will work on all geologies and all applications, but the world is a complex place. So really we need to tailor these multi-physics approaches for the, the specific cases that we're looking at. Yeah, do you, do you find uh, that a certain approach will work across a certain reservoir? Yes. So um, what we tend to find is that once we once we find an approach that, that works quite well in a setting, it'll work well in that geology across an area. So both of the examples I showed you were from the hoop area of the Barren Sea. Um, and, and that's not a coincidence. It's because those approaches work quite well in that geology and in that setting. Yeah. Uh, the second question from Sayed. Uh, in both examples, you did not consider the variations of wettability index in the models. No, I didn't. Um, I assumed that I had a single value of wettability um, calibrated at the well logs. So I assumed that that was basically calibrated and then known. But you raise an interesting point that whenever you use a rock physics relationship of any sort, there is an uncertainty associated with that. Um, now, to some extent, we can characterize that uncertainty. Um, and what I didn't talk about today was some of the other approaches that we've, we've developed. Um, when I say we, RSI, my colleagues at RSI developed um, for uh, taking into account the uncertainty in the rock physics relationship and in parameters such as the wettability index. So you can build that into uh, a, a more statistical or a Bayesian approach where that's part of the uncertainty in putting these data sets together. So um, there are approaches out there for doing that, but as you say, in this case, I just assumed we'd calibrated it and it was then essentially known. Uh, thank you. Uh, the, oh, a actually, that, question from Sayed. <laughs> can I, maybe because I have a, a, a question sort of to what you just said, Lucy. Um, so when you put all those uncertainties in there on all, on all the parameters, how bad does it get? I mean, I sometimes have the a feeling that we know some of these things not particularly well, that if you do that, sort of the connection nearly becomes and not quite meaningless, but very tentative. Or what do you see? Um, we, we've seen, of course, your uncertainties go up if you... If if, if you're honest about the range of things we don't know in the earth, then the uncertainties go up. Um, if, you're, if you're completely honest about the range of things that we don't know in the earth and about these relationships, then it's a wonder we can really tell anything at all about the subsurface. I mean, it's just amazing geophysics works at all sometimes when you look at all the things we don't know, um, but it does. <laughs> um, and so yes, we see an increase in uncertainty, but not to a level where we can't draw useful conclusions from the data. Yeah, and I mean, that's certainly something I share, that I'm always amazed that things <laughs> work so consistently when... Yeah, amazed yeah, it works you, at all. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the third question from Syed. Um, in the second example of vertical resistivity has very sharp jumps along the boundaries imposed from seismic imaging. Do you not think it was unrealistic? In addition, I could guess from the big difference between vertical and horizontal resistivities that the main axes of anisotropy are not horizontal and vertical, and may they have somehow rotated with some angles. Um, okay, yes, right. So a couple of things to address there. Yeah. So yeah. the reason that there were sharp jumps in resistivity is because that's what I asked the inversion to do. I allowed a regularization break at the um, at the boundary at the seismic derived boundaries 
Now, we know that that is realistic in the vicinity of a hydrocarbon charged reservoir because the top interface of the reservoir is a sharp boundary, it is a sharp jump in resistivity. Um, it's not so realistic elsewhere uh, where there probably are more gradual changes across those interfaces. Um, so um, it's certainly an approximation, um, but it's, it's an approximation. If you look away from the areas of the, the hydrocarbon, the jump is much smaller. Um, there are approaches out there for constraining with seismic that, that aren't as um, severe. Um, and I think Randy Mackey presented um, one of those in his m &R earlier in the series, looking at, at structural constraints that use a cross gradient between a seismic image and a, and a, a resistivity model. Um, that's a much less severe and, and probably geologically more realistic way of, of, of applying that constraint. I think that's a kind of neat algorithm, um, but that would be an alternative way of approaching it. Um, so in terms of the anisotropy, uh, the anisotropy in the Barents Sea is notoriously large. It's, it's some of the highest anisotropy you see anywhere. Um, the question of whether um, it's vertical or not is, again, a very interesting question. We've assumed in our inversion that we're dealing with VTI. Um, now, in this setting, that's probably not too bad an approximation. We're looking at faulted fault locks, and in all of the pictures I showed you, there was quite a high vertical exaggeration. But these are predominantly sub-horizontal layers uh, that have been squished at depth and then uplifted. So the, the, the approximation of, of VTI in this setting is probably not too bad, but it is an approximation. Um, there are settings, of course, where that approximation of, of vertical transverse isotropy is not a good approximation at all. So, um, for example, uh, there are examples on the flanks of salt diapirs where you see very steeply dipping stratigraphy. And there it's been shown that actually taking that tilted anisotropy into account is very important in getting the right result. So, yes, it's an approximation. I think it's probably an, appro uh, an approximation that's appropriate in this setting. But there are, of course, settings where TTI is an issue and should be accounted for in interpretation. Yeah, thank you, Lucy. Um, there seems to be no more questions. So I guess I'll thank you once again. And I'll just grab the uh, screen back from you and remind people that uh, this is the last uh, m &R. And I'd like to really sincerely thank uh, Lucy and all the previous presenters, but also the viewers of the MNRs and the um, and those who view the the content on the YouTube pages. And again, a plea for those who wish to volunteer: don't be shy. Send us your name, and we'll put you as a presenter for next season. So with that, I'll say goodbye again. Bye, bye, Lucy. Bye, everybody. Thanks a lot, meet everyone. You, meet you in season two in a few months' time. Bye for now. Bye. Bye.